Hey y'all, new day and a new verse. Monday got a little away from me, but you know, I was planning on doing two sections together anyway, so it's just happening today instead of yesterday. Let's dig in. One day he saw crowds gathering. Jesus went up on the mountainside and sat down. His disciples gathered around him, and he began to teach them. And I like to start this, this Sermon on the Mount, because, you know, Luke or it is the Sermon on the Plain. There's discussions there about which it is. You know, is it, well, is it, is it this? Is it two different speeches? Is it just a matter of perspective on what we call mountain? I'm more interested in the fact that Jesus sits down with the disciples there and starts to teach the disciples. And it made me think about teachers a little bit, how teachers will often teach to the students that want to learn. The others that are there... If they want to learn, they learn. If they're there just for whatever reason they're there, you know, to see a gimmick, to see that, to see whatever, it seems to me that sitting down just to enjoy the beauty and teach his disciples, I think it almost nods to the Sabbath, that it is in rest that a lot is accomplished. Because he's not standing in a pulpit and hammering and, you know, yes, he does teach inside the synagogues, but in this moment, I think it's just a matter of enjoying the beauty and seeing so many people. Because the Beatitudes, I think they go way deeper than just simple rote. And I think digging into them, they become experiences, they become almost part of life. But let's dig in. Verse 3. Then I'm just going to do the entire Beatitudes and then go back to them because I have a lot of fun with these. Blessed are those who are poor in spirit and realize their need for Him, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses those who mourn, for they will be comforted. God blesses those who are humble, for they will inherit the earth. God blesses those who hunger and thirst for justice and righteousness, for they will be satisfied. God blesses those who are merciful, for they will be shown mercy. God blesses those whose hearts are pure, for they will see God. God blesses those who work for peace, for they will be called the children of God. God blesses those who are persecuted for doing right, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses you when people mock you and persecute you and lie about you and say all sorts of evil things against you because you are my followers. Be happy about it. Be very glad, for a great reward awaits you in heaven. And remember, the ancient prophets were persecuted in the same way. You know, and, and I want to go over each one of these bit by bit, because like, bless, God blesses those who are poor in spirit and realize their need for Him. You know, God will put us back together when we let Him, when we recognize that this world is broken and humans can't fix it. If we could, why is it still broken? Because I know the argument that comes right after. Well, God helps those who help themselves. Pull yourself up by your bootstraps. That's not a concept. That doesn't even work on physics. You cannot literally pull yourself up by them. You can pull your bootstraps up, but you will not be pulled up by your own force. Like, I wish I was a better editor, because I would actually go through the math here. We can't do it. And it's not saying, oh, no, no. it's saying in those moments when we feel like we're pulling ourselves up by our bootstraps, it's the footsteps poem. Those days when you only saw one set of footprints, those were the days God is carrying you. Because they are. You know, where does that extra surge come from? Well, it came through this. God uses people. God uses events. God uses situation. The source of all life making sure you still have life in you. Recognizing that the world is broken, that we are broken and need Him, God blesses us. No, realizing that we need Him to set it right. Because even our own definition of setting it right doesn't always work. 
You know, well, they did this, so this is how we should deal with them. Well, are you omnipotent? Do you know all of the facts? Do we jump to conclusion? How often do we have issues and situations in today's society where a person is already condemned long before any of the facts have come out? It needs to be set right, and human beings can't do it. That's why we're just repeating history now. You know, God blesses those who mourn, for they will be comforted. It's okay to cry. It's okay to own the difficulty. It's okay to point out when you are walking through the valley of the shadow of death. Just don't set up camp there. You know, Lamentations is a book in the Bible for a reason. It is those moments of, yes, this is difficult. Yes, it is heartbreaking. Yes, it is troubling and trying. And what is happening is evil and wrong. Still, I will rejoice that my God is bigger and that he does set it right. Starting within us. And it's a beautiful thing that when we cry, when we let the pain get air, when we let the wound get to a place where it can be healed, those tears of pain and sorrow and lament become tears of joy. That yeah, the past happened, but it is no longer a chain that binds. It is a stone that can be used to help other people build past those pains so that we can rise up and grow by helping each other, by recognizing that some of the difficulties we've gone through in our lives may have absolutely nothing to do with us and may be for the person down the road who needs it. Blessed are those who are humble, for they will inherit the earth. Well, what is that kind of humility? To me, it's recognizing we are an image. We are the image of God. It is why we're not supposed to make any graven images according to the text. He already beat us to it by making us. And since you can't to the all-creator being into one single image, no, God already made his idols. That's what we are. We are images. What is it that an image is to do? That is the question. What does a bit of pottery do? What's it intended to do? Does it lord itself up over other places? No. It's designed for reason. Do we necessarily know what that reason is? No. Can we ask? Absolutely. Should we dig? 100%. Go find out. Ask God. He doesn't have any grandchildren. He doesn't have any of those other side. He has sons and daughters. He has us. And we have him. We don't need to put ourselves up as this greater than thou, holier than thou being. We're not. We're people. We're all on the same level, created equally. Loved equally and unfathomably by our creator. And that's a beautiful thing to me. We don't have to put each other up or down or try and do a keeping up with the Joneses or sorting each other out into who is what. We can simply enjoy the fact that, much like the garden, we can just be in beauty and joy and embrace the fact that God has given us a wonderful playground and that he sets it right. He sees to it. He is the living tabernacle. He is God-made flesh, and he walks us through life while walking with us through life. You know, the struggles that come, you know, why would God allow this? Let's go into Job then. And if anybody watching this has those questions, put it in the comments. I will seriously go over Job sooner rather than later, depending on what you guys want. Because, yeah, those questions, those difficulties, the why would God do it? Yeah, I get those well. And it's interesting that the three, pro uh, the three wisdom books in the Bible are Proverbs, the morality book, Ecclesiastes, which really is one of the more nihilistic texts I've ever read, but it's quite enjoyable when you read it from the right perspective, and Job, answering those questions uh, that we have. Not in a place of saying that God is out to screw us, or, or from a place of hating everyone, or thinking the world is picking on us. 
simply embracing the journey. As if we truly trust that our Abba Father has us in His hands, that though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we shall fear no evil, for He is with us. If we truly believe what is in this text, when God says, I will watch over you, then there doesn't need to be a pedestal fight. We're all tended to. He is Jaira, after all. And he proves himself that way in Exodus. The manna from heaven. You will always have enough. Those who got too much only had enough. Those who got too little only had enough. Those who picked it up the day before Sabbath or Shabbat had enough for Shabbat. There was always enough. Because God is the God of more than enough. So we don't have to lift each other or throw each other down to try and do a pecking order when we're all His. You know, God who blesses those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Now, the NLT version has for justice. Personally, I think the two are not necessarily too dissimilar. But I think justice has to be discussed from a more biblical perspective. Because to me, justice and mercy are two sides of the same coin. Much like love God, love others are two sides of the same coin. Which is the most important. Yes. Because justice is that wanting things to be set right. I think to truly have a heart that wants justice, though, it needs to understand that sometimes true justice is mercy. If you have a person who has done wrong over and over again and it finally has gauged on them that what they are doing is wrong and they want to fix it, and they want to do better. They want to turn from that kind of life and change the way they live. Change their focus and turn from it. Repent, if you will. Yes, I'm for a reason. Then mercy is justice. Because how can a person turn it around if you never give them the opportunity? So those who hunger for and thirst for justice, cool, yeah. Recognize that God's justice looks a bit different than ours. And trust that He is willing to set it right. That's why I think it's the righteousness. Because righteousness is the to be set right. It's setic. Uh, setic uh, it is that wanting things to be set right. Abraham is righteous through faith. He is set in a right relationship because of his trust. So, to me, the hunger and thirst for righteousness. Yeah, justice works on the understanding that justice, righteousness, being set right, well, justice truly met out is people being set right. Whether turned over to their own sin because they refuse to do, do anything else, or those who choose to change. It's often in the Bible, God doesn't have to send a plague like he does with Egypt. Often, and especially like he did with the people of Israel, he turned themselves over to their own thing. Greedy people eventually stolen from, murderers eventually killed, etc., etc., etc. So justice may look a little bit different than we think it will, but righteous, God setting everything right, God setting the balance right, that's something every culture has understood because it's something we all inherently want. We want the world to be set right. I think often the issue is that we want it set right by our standard and not his. And when we try and set it right by our own standard, that's when things start to burn down. Because no human being who is human alone understands what justice truly looks like. Because we don't have all the information. It's as simple as that. We do not know another person's heart, soul, mind, etc., their innermost being. We don't. But God does. And He will always set things right. It's one of His names. God blesses those who are merciful, for they will be shown mercy. You know, I wrote down in my notes that it's to Isaiah 6.6, 6, I deserve mercy, not sacrifice. And... You know, we'll get to that part a little later in Matthew. 
where he references it and actually says it. But no, reading this, it makes me think in this moment back to the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us, uh, bless us, O Lord, forgive us our trespasses, forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Now that would mean that if we are to be forgiven, we must first forgive. And Jesus says himself, he says to Peter, I believe it was, the how many times we must forgive? Seven times? I tell you, 70 times seven times. Because between the Beatitudes here of God blesses those who are merciful for they will be shown mercy, if you're not forgiving, if you're not having in your heart a place of God's mercy, how can we be forgiven? You know, God died to forgive us of our sins, but we're going to hold somebody's failure against them until hell freezes over? I don't believe we're going to see any forgiveness there. I don't. Especially since the prayer, forgive us as we forgive others. If you're not forgiving others, you're not necessarily forgiven. Now, saved by grace? That's something else. And that there, that's above my pay grade, admittedly. I'm still learning on that one. But walking before you can run on this one, if we're not showing mercy, if we're not living in forgiveness, kindness, compassion, the fruits of the Spirit, being pruned and made new, if we're not, it's something up. You know, and if you're in a rest period, recognize that. Because a rest period is a good thing. Plants need it after they're pruned too. We all do. And we have this Shabbat for a reason. Rest. Like, well, I don't necessarily know if I'm there. Well, if you're wondering, talk to God. He's right there. He wants to talk with us. He listens. We might not always, but he does. And he knows everything already. But it's the digging into the purposeful conversation, not just living by default. God blesses those whose hearts are pure, for they will see God. Yeah, and admittedly, this one always had me in question a little bit, especially growing up, because I, I was more akin to Satan incarnate. Like, s setting my driveway on fire was honestly just kind of peaceful to me. But, yeah, I was down that kind of direction. And so to me, it's like, God blesses those whose hearts are pure. Well, what's that mean for me? Because I have naughty thoughts. I, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera am human, and being perfected, as we all are, what is it to be pure then? And it made me think, or rather God put into my mind, what is when something is proven pure? Well, the metal, the slag's taken out of it. So when your heart is pure, I think that means it's God taking out the slag of humanity, the world, rather, <laughs> lowercase m, the zoo manatee, if you will, the cruelty. When God takes that out, takes the slag out. Because when you're heating metal and you're pouring it, you have to take the slag out, the runoff, the stuff that bubbles up to the surface. You have to take it out. You have to purify the metal, work out all the impurities so that you're working with the pure product. It takes a bit of heat, it takes some time, it takes some effort. But if it's that kind of proven pure, which does seem to fit quite in with the rest of the Bible's illusions, Ah, uh, illusions, you know, nodding to each other. Then it stands to me that the pure heart is one that God is fixing, setting right, removing the parts out. Especially since when we are dealing with life and trying to follow God, it'll cost us everything and it'll cost us nothing. And I don't know if I've said this here on YouTube, but I know I've said it to quite a few people in person. Because it's the truth of it. Grace, mercy, compassion, they cost us nothing. But they cost us everything in that, you know, forgive this person. Well, they wronged me. Yeah, you're going to have to get go, let go of that wrong. You are. And it's maybe something that you feel is part of your true makeup, part of the who you are. You may think it's part of your identity. You may think that that scar is what holds you together. The classic, I am my scars. No. 
No, you're not. Scars are just proof that you've made it through an interesting ride. And they're proof that God has brought you through it. As loving others doesn't cost us a thing unless our ego is in the way. Showing mercy to others doesn't cost us a thing unless we prefer our version of justice to God's. Compassion doesn't cost us a thing unless we'd rather hold on to our own crap rather than try to live in pursuit of God, loving Him, loving others. God blesses those who work for peace, for they will be called the children of God. And it's interesting, especially considering the fact that Jesus is the Prince of Shalom, peace, wholeness, completeness. Well, if we're working for peace, wholeness, completeness, if we're working to set things right, being God's hands and feet, especially since He is the head, we are not. Cannot stress that enough. We are not. When we're being the hands and feet, when we're living for peace, to set things right, when we're trying to make it a little better. Is that not a beautiful thing? I mean, God, Jesus, Son of God, points out the fact that we are adopted in. We are sons and daughters too. So, in an interesting way of reading it, a child of God is one who works for peace. Now, I do think that he orders it the way he does to try and make a point here that when we work for peace, other people will notice it and talk about the praises of it. Because we instinctually know on a deeper plane, a deeper level, that this way of doing it isn't right. We spend our lives trying to justify it, but we all know it's not. Taking another life, nobody has that right. Nobody. Doing the acts of cruelty and brutality toward each other. Nobody has that right. But we can all work for peace. We can stand and say it's not right, but I won't resort to that behavior either. And it digs even down those. It's interesting that he puts it together. God blesses those who were per, persecuted for doing right, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. And the two almost go together. Because if you're chasing after Christ, if you are living after Him, following the Prince of Shalom, Him moving in and setting all things right as it moves out and out and out, well, of course people are going to be angry about that and yell at each other. I mean, the world is kind of cruel to itself anyway. But when you point out the fact that human behavior is cruel, when you hold up a mirror that says, this is not okay, and people have to own the fact that they're doing wrong, they get violent, they get angry, they get savage. And God saying, you are blessed even when you're, persec when you're persecuted for doing right. And it's the doing right part. You know, oh, I'm doing this, and they're, they're persecuting me. Haters going to hate. Mm. People will do what they are going to do because they're people. If you're doing something worthy of being praised, it will be praised. If you're doing something that needs to be called out, it will be called out. If everybody is saying, murder bad, and you murder, haters gonna hate. No, you were a dick. I mean, if you want the do this, don't do that kind of stuff, Proverbs is in there. There's 613 laws in the Torah, first 10 will do ya. In, in fact, it's, it's interesting that the roadmap of tries to follow the law, get, uh, breaks it, gets more, tries to follow, gets more, breaks it, tries to get more. Kind of aside from the fact that it proves, even on a biblical level, that you cannot legislate morality, 
shows that legalism will never get you there. Faith will. God has to move in and circumcise the heart. He has to break the heart of stone and give us a new one. He has to write His word, His law, His way of doing it on our hearts to hit Moses, uh, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel for their way of putting it. Something deeper has to change. And if people hate you because you're doing right, God will see you through it anyway. Oh, well, I, I blew the whistle because what they were doing is wrong and they fired me. God will provide. Do what is right. Well, I have to go along to get along. No, you have to do what is right. Because a little farther up, the those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for justice, God will set it right. Do what is right. Because when God sets those scales, we're all going to have to be accountable for what we've done. Grace saves us. Absolutely. Still have to at least own the fact, you know, well, you claim to be a Christ follower. Yeah? Why'd you embezzle money? Because I... No. That's what Judas did. Don't do that. That's a no. But persecuted for doing right? Because there is a distinct difference. And this is where it's interesting that it is both black and white and recognizing the shades of gray. Just the biblical text recognizes we live in a world of shades of gray. It's also saying you have the choice to follow the actual black and white good or evil. Because we understand on a deeper level, instinctually, it is the fact that we are his creation. His fingerprints are on all of us. So we understand certain things. We just spend our life justifying not doing them. The last two verses. God blesses you when people mock you and persecute you and lie about you and say all sorts of evil things about you because you are my followers. See Twitter. Be happy about it. Be very glad about it. For a great reward awaits you in heaven. And remember, the ancient prophets were persecuted in the same way. You know, it's beautiful to me that, you know, like, how could you be happy about it? How could you be glad about it? It's like Paul in Philippians. Rejoice. Because God's got us. He's got all of us, every aspect of us knew and had us in mind before the foundations of the earth, placed exactly where and when for a reason. We may not always have all the information, but when we trust, when we live, when we follow after Him, there's a sense of peace to it. And yeah, people will mock, I mean, Job's wife, oh, you just curse God and be done with it already, and Job's like, mm, nope, mm -mm, nope. Why? Because we know better. Now, this might annoy a few people, but I've seen too much to be an atheist. I've seen too much to not believe in the supernatural. I've seen too much to not believe that there is that different set of rules than the human way. And if people are like, oh, well, you're not playing the human game, you're right. And I won't with a gun to my head. I won't. Dog eat dog killing each other. You didn't do this, so you're evil. You did that, so you're evil. If you're trying to knife each other, you're both doing 